have questions. If some of this, I mean, there's there's no way to really cover certificates in an hour or so. So as we go through this, you guys have questions. If there's specific areas you're interested in, speak up. Try to address that. If not, afterwards, happy to answer any questions you guys have. So let's make this uh, as exciting as digital certificates could possibly be. <laughs> okay, so settle down. Calm down. We'll get through this. Okay? So we're going to be covering uh, certificates, why certificates are important, uh, the anatomy of certificates, like what is in a certificate. It's kind of important. The ecosystem of certificates, what are the different components. Uh, we'll talk about um, how certificates are created at a very basic level, including a, a, a little bit about how they do it on Linux. Uh, best practices, kind of a little snapshot of best practices. Um, we'll also cover how to launch PKI in your companies. So if you don't already have it, or you have it, but you want to really make it formalized um, and actually make it really useful, we'll talk a little bit about how to get that started as well. So, before we get started, I would like to know how many people in this room have ever created a digital certificate? Okay, that's not bad. Maybe half. Um, how many people manage a certificate authority within their company? All right, four. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so we have some real experts in the room. We'll defer to you guys when I, I don't know the answer to anything. So, what is a certificate? Um, it's a, we're talking about public key certificates in particular here. <clears throat> These are digital tokens that are made up and uh, uh, that, are comp that are component of a public key infrastructure, or PKI. PKI is a term you use, uh, you, you may hear quite extensively, it's an overarching term. Uh, certificates are one component of a PKI. Um, so you think of it as uh, PKI is an entire system that has many different uses, but the ultimate goal of it is to deliver uh, certificates that you can use to authenticate, validate, and assure I, uh, someone's identity or the identity of a computer. The uh, X509 uh, standard by ITU um, is what is commonly um, used as the de facto standard when you talk about digital certificates. This is a standard that's been around for many decades, um, but really the advent of uh, the internet and web browsers um, was the first major worldwide application of certificates. Their certificates have been used for many things, but the, the internet really was a driving force behind making certificates uh, what they are today. Uh, a certificate is essentially a small piece of binary data that is also uh, represented in a text format. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's essentially a standardized file format, okay? And what goes into the file format, the anatomy of certificate is, is fairly extensive, and I'll, I'll, talk about, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. The purposes of, of a certificate are really to uh, validate the identity of a person, a computer, or a piece of software. Okay, those are the main uses. You can use it for other things as well. Um, you can use it also to validate the content to see if it's been tampered with. This is fairly important when you're dealing with something like software. If you want to publish software to someone as a software publisher, uh, you want to be able to assure the customer, the customer wants to be able to validate, hey, the software actually came from that company. And you can also use certificates to do encryption of data. Okay, we're, we're not going to talk much about that today. But that's a, uh, another way of doing um, encryption, especially across in, uh, something like the internet, where people are distributing content, um, and they don't want to do it using just a password. Okay, you can use certificates for that as well. 
So certificates are really the foundation of network security today. Okay? Certificates are used for things like SSL and TLS, uh, email, code signing, that's for, for software publishers, encryption, IPsec, and VPN. You guys probably have at least two, if not all of these, in your organizations today. These are already certificate-based services. So half of you raised your hand. I would say probably 99% of you have certificates in your company. Okay, you might not even realize it. Uh, of course, uh, SSL um, is what the HTTPS protocol is based on top of, um, <coughs> along with various applications that use SSL. Okay, SSL um, is now known as TLS. Anyone know what TLS stands for? Transport level security, I believe. Yes, yes. Um, transport layer security. Transport layer, yes. So SSL was essentially renamed when it was standardized um, and is now known as TLS. All right, so why are certificates important? Why am I here? Um, <laughs> certificates are the fundamental way of securing um, web browsing today. Okay. Well, whenever you go to an HTTPS website, you're getting a certificate from that website. Your traffic between you, your browser and that site is encrypted using TLS. Okay. Um, it's the, the, the main way that you can protect your privacy and your customers can be protected when communicating. Okay. This is both uh, for commercial and for privacy reasons. Obviously, if you're dealing with an application and you want to secure communications over a network, you want it to be encrypted. Email is also uh, used extensively, well, not extensively yet, but email communications from a transport layer, when, it trans um, when email is transmitted between servers, is usually sent over TLS and therefore encrypted okay, with certificates. Email you read in your mailbox, 99% of that, it's not encrypted. Okay. There are ways of securing your email so that you can validate that the person who sent the message really sent it. And you can either, you can go further to validate the content hasn't been tampered with. That's all done using certificates as well, but those that use in email clients is not very widespread because distributing and creating certificates is still very difficult to at the consumer level and at a company to company level. So, why are software why are certificates important? For software publishers, it's, it's critical um, that when they distribute software and it runs on a customer's computer, that the customer can have some kind of assurance that it's really from that publisher. Now, for a long time in the Microsoft world, uh, uh, software publishers would create drivers, um, installers, they just ship them out. Um, <coughs> customers would install them and they, they would assume they work. In today's world, there's a lot of malware out there, right? So, the soft uh, Microsoft's Windows for the last 10 years or so has built in certi certificate validation of software. Okay, so both at a driver level and at a application level. And in fact, you can install certain types of software on a Windows device without having that software signed and validated with a code signing certificate. These are some of the messages you may have seen. Uh, do you want to allow the following program from the unknown publisher to make changes to this computer? Okay, that that would be a message you would get um, from someone who hasn't signed their application. And in fact, in Windows 10, you can't even really do that anymore. The bottom message is what you typically get. You get a message saying, hey, you haven't seen this before, do you want to allow this? Windows 
this means that Windows has validated the software has come from that publisher. Today in Linux, uh, there's a little bit of this in the form of RPM packages that are signed, um, but it's not really embedded at a very low level um, into the, uh, the dpackage system or RPM. Okay, it's really kind of an optional thing, and that's one of the areas where Linux is really lagged behind um, in terms of validating software. So in enterprise IT systems, certificates are really important when you have internal websites, right? How many people have internal websites in their company? How many of you know that you are using HTTPS? Yeah. So most of you, that's good. You know, most companies when they build their internal networks these days, they assume that, you know, some bad guys might get into their networks. You know, having internal websites use SSL is really important because it prevents people from snooping, intercepting, and tampering with traffic. Okay? It's very, very difficult to do any of those things when you're using certificates and HTTPS properly. There's lots of ways to use it improperly and think that you're secure. Um, and that's where, you know, having a good PKI practice is, is really important. Uh, email validation, I talked a little bit about this earlier. Inside individual companies, it is fairly straightforward to create and distribute certificates for email that are placed in email applications. And what happens is you'll get, you'll send a message and there'll be a certificate that's attached to that, and the receiver can validate that, hey, that person really sent that message. Now, it takes a lot of work to do that. If you're an all Microsoft shop, it's fairly straightforward. But no one has an all Microsoft shop, not even Microsoft. <laughs> um, so th 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 these are goals that you can accomplish in your company um, in a mixed Linux and Windows environment. Um, and if you're interested in that, you know, we can talk offline, but it's, it's a big topic on itself. Uh, infrastructure protection inside uh, enterprise IT is also really important. Most of your networking gear uses certificates, or can use. A lot of times it's disabled by default, because you have to get the certificates on your networking devices, you have to set up certificate authority trust, a whole lot of things have to happen for your networking devices, but why aren't you doing that? Do you want your traffic to be intercepted by the bad guys when you're logged in and configuring your device, your core network switch, a firewall? Sometimes it's there, but usually you have to set that up. So that's an area that you have to be really careful about. VPNs as well. So. Uh, when you set up a VPN between two points, there's a number of layers of security you can use. The simplest is a password, right? You give the user a username and a password and say, here you go, use that. Well, your credentials aren't secure. Most security recommendations around VPN involve having a certificate placed on every EndNode device. So every person's laptop that does VPN. Okay, you, when you use a combination of <laughs> certificates and passwords, you have a fairly secure environment. But if you're just using a password, you know, there's a lot of ways for the, that person, person's uh, credentials to be stolen. Okay? So if you give someone a, a username and password and some bad guy finds that, well, they can use their own device to log in and use that, right? If you're using uh, a certificate as well, that's another piece of data that's very hard for them to get, and it's very unlikely that they'll be able to duplicate both of those. All right, this is a certificate. Well, at least it's my boiled down version. The actual content format of certificate um, is the topic of, of a half a day's worth of discussion, but <laughs> I've kind of boiled it down to the most important and Super exciting sections. Okay, there's nothing more exciting than what's in a certificate, right? 
So first off, there's a version number. <clears throat> okay, uh, version three. Uh, there was a version one and two, but version three has been the X509 standard now for I don't know how many years. It's it's not likely to change. <coughs> Every certificate when it's generated has a unique serial number. <coughs> so when you have to get down to the nitty gritty and compare certificates, the serial number is the unique identifier that you want to use uh, to figure out are two certificates the same. Has a certificate been tampered with in some very weird but bizarre uh, fashion? So, uh, certificates are, are signed with a signature, and what you, one of the things you have to have in the uh, certificate is you need to understand what the signing algorithm was. So that when, you're, when a piece of software is decrypting or validating the certificate, it knows what algorithm to apply. So RSA 512, pretty much the standard you'll see in most certificates. Now, finally, you have the uh, issuer name. And this is the uh, certificate authority, which I'll talk about a little later, that issued this certificate. Okay? And um, certificates use uh, what's called X500 name formats, or distinguished names. So here, DC Com, DC Contoso, common name, Contoso issuing certificate authority. Okay, so Contoso.com, and the common name was the Contoso issuing issuing CA. That is the um, entity, the CA that created this certificate. You have a valid start and an end date. So certificates have a finite lifetime. Most web-based certificates, um, you're typically going to have a one-year, maybe a two-year, occasionally a three-year. Um, if you're really crazy, then you'll, you can create a certificate with a four- or five-year. Uh, those are very unusual and they're very dangerous. Any, anyone want to know why it's dangerous? Who, who knows why they're dangerous to have a long expiration? It just gives you that much more time to break it. Yeah, pretty much. So. There's, there's different um, the <coughs> signature algorithms that go into these things eventually get broken. So if you can break that, then you can reproduce a certificate and put whatever you want into it. So you want to have a finite lifetime, typically one or two years, for most certificates. Okay, because it's, those certificates in general are relatively easy to replace. But if, if you have a five-year certificate, you're, you're kind of asking for it. The, the encryption that are, that's used on the certificate is almost certainly going to be broken in that amount of time. All right, subject name. This is what the certificate is actually for. Okay? Here, the common name is Zeus.contoso.com. The organization is Contoso Inc. So this is really, uh, this certificate is for a computer called Zeus.contoso.com. That is, what, um, uh, that is what identifies this certificate. What is the purpose of the certificate? Okay. It would be placed on the zeus.contoso.com server, and, and that's what it would provide. That's the identity of the certificate. There's also a public key. Um, the public key is actually what, what is typically uh, uh, broken. Um, the, the, the public key will identify the algorithm, RSA. Who knows what RSA stands for? You guys probably all heard it, but who knows what it stands for? Uh, if I get the names right, Rybist, uh, Shainer, and <laughs> Hank. It's the three uh, uh, professors that uh, took the um, uh, Dippy Hellman and the uh, one time, not one time, they had the idea algorithm and combined it into the one Chinese um, arithmetic test. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. It's named after the three original creators of the algorithm. Um, there are extensions <coughs> galore for certificates. Many, many extensions. And this is why this, this format, this file, will probably never change, or not in my lifetime, is because the extensions are extendable. You can add whatever. Um, uh, new future extensions you want. 
Very important, two of them are the extended key usage. Okay, this says, this is the type of certificate. Remember I said there are certificates for web servers, <coughs> code signing, email, all sorts of things. This one is server authentication. That means it's for web servers in general. It can also be used for applications, but when you go to a HTTPS website, the, the certificate is a server authentication certificate. And one of the extensions is a SAN. Who knows what SAN stands for? It's not a storage area network. <laughs> it's a subject alternate name, or SAN. So <coughs> certificates have SANs, and there's different types of SANs, but DNS is what's used to essentially name a host. Okay, so you can have a certificate that can be for multiple host names. So if you have a web server that's www.acme.com and it's also you know www.acme.com you can put that in the certificate okay so you don't have to have multiple certificates for each different name there's also a the signature algorithm and the certificate um, uh, bits itself so again I'm not going to go into that uh, but does anyone have any questions kind of on the general exciting format of the file? I know it's overwhelming. Okay. Not exactly the format, but you mentioned version 3 is going to be with us for a while, but then the key length or size, it might be broken, and so will it remain version 3 and they just keep boosting the key size? Well, that's, that's, that's just it. The, the reason that the, the signature algorithm and the um, uh, it is, is encoded in the file is so that you can change it. The certificate is created with whatever signature algorithm um, is commonly used and accepted in the world. Okay, so if someone invents a new signature algorithm, you, you have to, you don't want to create certificates unless you know that your um, certificate consumers, like web browsers, support and understand that uh, algorithm. Okay, so the, the format of the certificate doesn't change. It's just what you put in it changes. Okay, so server off, most commonly used, we talked about. That's the little green icon in the web browser. Um, there's actually two types, okay? Notice we have a green icon up top for Google, but down here we have the words um, Mozilla Foundation US with the green icon. Those are, those are two different types, okay? So on the top one is what's called an organization validated certificate. This is kind of like the entry level certificate. It means that the issuer has validated that you work for that company. Okay? Minimum, it, you know, very basic that most companies automate that kind of validation. Extended validation means they've gone through an extra level. Okay? They have looked at more resources more public records to validate you are who you claim to be. For that privilege, you get to pay 10 times more <laughs> for your certificate, and that allows you to get your name in that, in that really nice area of the web browser there. That's what, that's what you're getting there. It's called an extended validation certificate. Okay? Notice Google, those cheapskates, they're not using an EV. Okay? I wonder why. All right, other kind of certificate types. Client authentication. So if you have VPN, as I was talking about earlier, and you want to have certificates on both sides, on the EndNote device, the laptop, you would issue a client authentication certificate. Looks just like a server authentication certificate, except it has that type in it. That means it's only intended to be used to identify a client application connecting to a server application. So in this case, the VPN client would read the client off certificate and provide it to your VPN server. Okay? File formats are all the same. It's just the one bit in the file that says what's the certificate type is set to client authentication. Code signing, almost the same thing. Essentially, there are 
they just go in and they change the um, certificate usage type to one of these values. There's actually more than a dozen of them. These are just some of the most common. Email protection is another one. Certificate looks just like I showed you, except it says uh, this certificate is uh, email, and the subject might be Mike Cooper. Okay? That's it. It won't be for a computer name, it'll be for a person instead. With my email address in there. So that will be part of what's in the email certificate. So, certificate trust. How does, how does this work? Why, you know, you don't just create a certificate file and it just magically works, right? Nothing works that easily. So what, what's, what happens is um, when you open a web browser and you go to a site like google.com, it's going to use TLS. Um, the server is going to send its certificate down to the browser. Uh, the browser is going to take the certificate. It's going to look inside it, look for the issuer. In this case, it's going to say the Google Internet Authority G2. So it's going to take that certificate and it's going to go and look at the what's known as a certificate authority trust tree. Okay, it's going to go up and it's going to look in a, a built-in list of <laughs> trusted certificate authorities. So most every browser has a built-in list of trust. It the browser checks that the certificate was signed by some certificate authority in a tree for every certificate, okay? So Mozilla, Chrome, uh, IE, all have generally the same list of certificate authorities. Uh, there's hundreds of them in there. They're not thousands, but there are hundreds. Uh, and that's how the, the trust is authenticated by that black magic list, okay? You, as the user of a browser, can add your own trust, okay? All the browsers allow you to go in and say, hey, trust my company's certificate authority. And that's part of when you roll out a PKI, you need to publish that CA trust, okay? Your own. And that's a whole other topic. <coughs> Any questions on how this works? Now, one of the things here is there's a tree of certificate authorities. Um, so, I, this is really important. So, the, the, the issue of this certificate is the Google Internet Authority G2. The browser doesn't have to have that certificate authority in its trust list. That certificate, the issuer's certificate, is actually signed by the GeoTrust Global CA. That's what's called a root CA. So most browsers will actually have the GeoTrust Global CA in its accepted trust list. They won't have the Google Internet one. The browsers do chaining to validate the certificates. Okay? And that's one of the very powerful features of PKI is you don't have to list every certificate authority you trust. There's a signing chain. All right, so I've used a bunch of terms here because i got to say something to start with. So let's talk about some of the things we haven't, I, I mentioned it, but really haven't talked about what they are. So everything really starts with subject entities. Okay, this is a computer, like a web server. Or it's a person who wants to validate their email address. Okay? Um, certificate consumers are things like web browsers or applications that need certificates to read and validate things. The certificate authorities are the entities that create certificates. Okay? This is specialized software. OpenSSL is one form of it, but uh, on a very simple scale. Um, but certificate authorities are essentially companies, public companies. Some You can be a certificate authority yourself, but those are the ones that issue the certificates. The certificate authorities publish their CA certificates, and hopefully those are accepted into common things like browsers. Okay. Now, if you are <coughs> launching a PKI into your company, you are unlikely to get your CA 
published as a accepted trusted list into say Chrome. There are ways around that. You can, through special arrangement with a commercial CA, you can get a signing agreement and all sorts of complicated things. But for the most part, when you have your own PKI, you have to be responsible for ensuring your certificate authority is trusted by your uh, web browsers, by your applications. Okay. Now, I, public and private keys are are, are another topic, uh, good for many hours of super <laughs> exciting and uplifting entertainment. Uh, but I wanted to touch on them because they're really uh, a key part of. Uh, certificates. So uh, essentially um, what happens is you have a private key and a public key. The public key, uh, these are generated um, uh, using certain algorithms and the public key is what you publish and give away and the private key is what you use to sign a file. Certificate file or perhaps a uh, you're, you're encrypting a file, you use your private key to do that. The public key is what someone can use to validate that the document they have received, the file they have received, matches. Okay, so certificates have a strong dependency on public and private keys because the certificates are created with a private key and then they're validated with the public key. This is how they're created. First, you start with a really, really good random number. <laughs> okay? You know, before I got into this, I never realized how much time some people spent on truly random garbage. Because <laughs> really good random garbage is gold. Okay? Um, most computers can generate a random number, but in many cases, it can be guessed with the right computing hardware. So, um, over time, the algorithms used to create these random numbers change. And this is one of the things we were talking about earlier, where um, uh, certain algorithms become susceptible to being guessed. So, Randomness is really important, and in many companies, uh, private keys are generated by dedicated <coughs> hardware modules that um, have proprietary um, generation algorithms and are very hard to guess, and they're also very hard to get into. Okay, you never want to give away access to a private key. It's very important. Once some an attacker has access to a private key that key is, is, is compromised. Anything that's signed by it can be reproduced maliciously. So it's really important. Um, so keys have an algorithm and a key size. RSA is the most commonly used in the world. And there are different key sizes. So um, it used to be that 512 bits was, wow, super secure. That was a long time ago. Um, today, uh, 2048 is kind of the, st the standard today. Most web browsers will reject any uh, anything like 1024 or less. 1024 RSA or less is considered insecure. 20, uh, 4096 is the next level up. Um, there's no definition beyond that. You will see some 4096 keys. The downside to these larger keys the size grows, okay? RSA is not a very compact format for keys. So um, people doing IoT stuff uh, <coughs> don't really like RSA because the key size is getting so large that these little tiny devices uh, have very low bandwidth. So um, there's another um, algorithm called ECC, elliptical crypt, uh, elliptical curve cryptography. It, it has much smaller key sizes, um, and that's, that's one of the standards that's kind of emerging in the IoT area. 
is a smaller key size means the certificates are smaller, which makes the transmissions um, a lot easier over really low bandwidth uh, links. Okay, so how do you create a certificate? How many people here have created them? I, I get about half, right? How many people have done it on Linux? OpenSSL? Yeah, anyone not using OpenSSL to create a certificate? What did you use? I also used uh, PGP and a couple of proprietary algorithms. And of course, Tiffy Hellman all the time. Okay. All right. Well, I'm curious to know what uh, Amazon Web Services is using for theirs. Okay, so uh, Amazon on AWS, they have developed their entirely own certificate authority infrastructure with their own APIs. <laughs> okay? Um, if you're someone like Amazon, you can do that. Uh, there are a ton of public certificate authorities out there that each use their own developed uh, certificate generation. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket scientists to, to make certificates. Okay? It, it's, it's, it's really not. And my company actually does make certificates. But that's something else. Um, so here's the basic process is the uh, subject entity, let's say you want to create a, a certificate for a web server. You as a user use something like OpenSSL to create a certificate signing request, a CSR. Very exciting file. It basically is, contains the components for the certificate. What the subject is, Maybe when you want it to expire, the type of certificate, um, you sign it with your private key. You take that and you hand the CSR off to a certificate authority. How you do that varies tremendously. If you're getting a certificate, say, from uh, VeriSign, you'd upload it to their website, you give them the CSR, or you, you could even skip the CSR site. <coughs> Anyone want to know? Uh, know why it's a bad idea to ha not generate your own CSR. Obviously, man in the middle. But who else do you trust to do it? Uh, essentially. So, so a, a lot of the commercial sites, you fill out a web form, and behind the scenes, they create a CSR. But guess what? To do that, they need your private key. Yeah. And guess what? They don't ask for your private key. They create their own They'll transmit that back to you very handily, but it's going over email. Okay, maybe it's encrypted when it comes back to you, but they're going to hand you a private key over over the internet. Okay, it's not not the greatest in security by any means. Yeah, so they have your private key now, and they have your private key. Yeah, yeah. And supposedly they deleted it or or not. The, you can believe whatever you want to believe. <laughs> I assume that they've kept the key and they're ready to reproduce it if I don't pay my bill. Um, <laughs> most of these sites will take a CSR. Okay, So if you're paying a certificate, don't be lazy. Skip filling out the form. Okay, Create your own CSR and cut and paste it into their um, CSR uh, acceptance site. Okay, Most of them will take either filling out the form or a CSR that you generate and cut and paste it. A little tip there. So the CSA, CA is going to take that CSR data, it's going to do whatever validation is appropriate. Um, like if I submit a certificate to uh, uh, VeriSign and I say, I'd like to be um, web.google.com, okay, they're going to say no, <laughs> right? Um, they're going to do their validation, they're going to say, hey, yeah, you're not Google, so you cannot have this certificate, okay? They're, Going, if I if I form a new company and I want a certificate, they'll do some kind of validation. They'll look at, they'll have me provide some DUNS information. They'll have me upload a special file to my website, and they'll go and look at that offline or something like that. So they'll do some <laughs> form of validation. I hope. Once they've done that, they'll create a certificate. They'll email it to me, probably with the private key that they created, and say, "Here you go." Okay. You then you take that key. And you download it somewhere, you stuff it onto Apache, or whatever the application is that's going to serve that. You will need your private key to unlock that certificate to whatever the application is. So if the certificate's for a web server, you're using Apache, Apache needs a certificate file, 
and the private key. So, Linux, <laughs> yes. This is the essential process to create a certificate on Linux using Open, open SSL. Um, anyone can do this, okay? Uh, first, you're going to create a private key using Open SSL, Gen RSA, create an RSA uh, private key, size 2048, puts it in this file called zeus.contoso.com by key. Then you go run this next command, open SSL rec new SHA-256, blah, blah, blah. This will create the CSR, okay? It will interactively prompt you to fill in stuff like the country name, the state, the city, uh, the common name, zeus.contosa.com. That's one of the most important things because that's this, essentially the subject of the certificate. And you can specify all this on a command line through some incredibly <laughs> obtuse command line options. That I got to give the open SSL guys, they, they really went out of the way to make those command options obtuse, but you can do it on the command line. <clears throat> okay, once you have that CSR file, um, you can do a number of things. One is you could go to a commercial CA like VeriSign, Global Sign, and say, hey, here it is. Here's my CSR, cut and paste it and you can get your certificate that way. Um, you pay them some money. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah, you gotta pay them money. <laughs> They're not in it for free. Um, then you, uh, you can essentially go, you know, you download it and you can install the files. One of the important things is when you do this, the CA Trust um, has to be updated as well. So if you go to uh, some of the really cheap uh, CAs, they're, they might not be trusted by your web browser. So you'll have to get their CA trust, which is the certificate for their certificate authority, and update your web browsers. Okay. Usually you don't need to do that. All right, so a little pros and cons really quick on this. Uh, you can use OpenSSL, this process. Almost any Linux or Unix machine. It's completely free. Um, until you, I mean, you can issue your own certificate, but that's that's really a bad idea. It's called a self-signed certificate, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, one of the biggest problems, though, is um, this is a very <laughs> error-prone process. You're going to get a certificate back. The, the CA will automatically assign an expiration, depending on how much money you pay. Okay? If you want a six-month one, it's one fee. If you want one year, it's more, and so on. The most, the number one problem uh, IT folks have with certificates is they expire, right? They expire in a year. How many people remember to go and renew your certificate before they expire? Put it on the calendar. Yeah. If you're lucky, you put it in your calendar. What if, what if, uh, you know, you're out skiing when that certificate expires in a year? Well, usually have several months in advance. <laughs> You're more organized than many. <laughs> but that's a real problem. So, so this kind of thing might be okay for one or two certificates, but um, especially if you have critical systems, you really need a certificate management system, something to manage this process and make sure the renewals happen. Oh, look. My company actually sells a product. Uh, I slipped this slide in accidentally. I'm sorry. <laughs> so my company is Revisent, and we do have a product called CertiCord, and its purpose is really to solve this problem. So it's a bridge between certificate authorities, like the Microsoft <laughs> Certificate Authority, and um, in, in the coming weeks, we're going to be supporting global side as well. You have a Linux client. You run a really simple command, CMB agent, cert create, purpose web server, takes care of everything. Okay, creates a certificate comes back, installs it, it will renew it for you. So you don't have to put it in your calendar. Okay, it does a lot more than that too, but um, CertiCord is a system that also automates all of the key generation. Always keeps the key on the local system, very secure, um, and it means you're not gonna forget things. Okay, so thank you for your patience. <laughs> I that one. Yeah. I wonder how quick it is. Can I put it into a system that automatically generates virtual machines and 
Yes. Docker. Okay. Yep. It's very easy to install. Uh, we have a central management console. And this single command, you can stuff into your, your Docker build or whatever to create a certificate. It's, it's very straightforward. All right. So, self-signed certificates. Don't use them, okay? <laughs> What's the point of a certificate? Authentication. Authentication, to validate that this is who it says it is, right? Who can, who can tell me what a self-signed certificate is? Right, a certificate you create yourself. So how does someone else in your company know that that certificate you created yourself, only you created, it's in my handwriting. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I put, a, you put the password into the certificate, so, yeah. right? Right. That only works briefly. It's a real dead end. Okay. Um, Self-signed certificates kind of defeat the purpose. It gets around some of the warnings. And in fact, in most web browsers now, they've gone from giving you a little warning saying, "Oh, it's self-signed. It's it's not validated." Chrome now, it won't even let you go to that page. Some versions, it, you can go through some menus to get there, but in most cases now, you can't even get there. So self-signed certificates uh, might be a, a good quick way to test something out, but long term, it's, it's not a really good uh, solution. Completely gives a false sense of security. Okay, you might see the little green icon up there, but it's not secure. It's, it's really not. What about routers that uh, self-sign their certificates? Over the management console. Yeah, that's still common. Um, again, most of the the enterprise grade ones, you can put in your um, own CA generated certificates um, with the CA trust of your enterprise, and you won't have that problem. But by default, they're going to ship oftentimes um, with a self signed certificate, especially the lower end ones. Um, some of the higher end enterprise ones will will we'll ship with a certificate that's that's been generated, that you know Cisco's paid for or whatnot. But in in general, you have to issue your own, and that's part of having an enterprise PKI is, is to be able to do that. All right, some really brief best practices: um, eliminate manual processes. Okay. Again, if you have more than a couple certificates, okay, you're going to forget about them. You know, you're, someone's going to leave the company, someone new's going to come along. They're like little time bombs, <laughs> okay? Especially in any kind of medium to high use service. They're just waiting to one day, poof, VPN has stopped working, <laughs> okay? That, in, that internal payroll application is, it can't communicate. There are no paychecks going on. Or if you have a, you know, an assembly <coughs> line, that's even worse. Pick a management product, okay? You can spend a little bit to a massive amount of money on certificate management. Pick something. Don't just get by. You will, or probably may have already lost a lot of money um, by not managing it or by um, having some compromises in your network that you know of or may not know of, be proactive. So, launching PKI. Many of you already have it, but how many of you have um, actual staff dedicated to PKI? A few? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope there's a little more to it because it's a very powerful um, thing to do in your company, and it adds a massive amount of additional security. It doesn't take an army to do this, but it does take some deliberate thought. So one of the first things you have to do is you have to identify all the platforms that you, you need to do PKI on. Okay? Obviously, first thing to do is count, count up the Linux systems. They're the most important. Okay? Windows systems, yeah, I know, those are secondary, um, but still very important. Aside from that, there's quite a lot of other platforms. The networking devices we alluded to, Macs. Macs make quite a lot of use of certificates if they're configured to do so. Um, pretty much anything that connects to the network can have a certificate, and in many cases should. Okay. 
identifying your existing certificates. When you have a management system when you're launching PKI, first thing you have to know of, you, you need to do some kind of inventory. And there's a number of ways you can do that. But an inventory is your first step towards understanding what you have and what your true PKI should be. Because you probably have a lot of certificates. If you haven't been managing them, they probably come from many different suppliers. They have different expirations. They have different, many of them may be compromised. They may use insecure signatures, okay, hashing algorithms. You obviously have to choose a good CA product. Um, you know, if you have a large Microsoft environment, the Microsoft ADCS is, is free. It's built into Windows. Um, and with certain products, like CertiCord, you can bridge that into Linux very easily. Okay? There are other very expensive products that will bridge onto Linux um, and most of the Unixes as well. Those are, those are a different story. But there are many options to do this. Create a project plan. This is a real project. It's not a, oh, it'd be nice if we had this. <laughs> if, if the, you, you know, um, my partner is also a, a, a consultant in this space, and he, he goes into Fortune 500 companies all the time where PKI is kind of an afterthought, where they've hired a contractor, he's put into place PKI, and guess what? They can't really change it. It doesn't grow with the company. Um, you really have to put some careful thought into your certificate authorities, the types of certificates, policies around those. If you don't, you could wind up having to touch every system in your enterprise multiple times. That is not fun. Uh, the CA hierarchy is one of the most fundamental things. Okay. Um, the, there's root certificates and there's issuing certificates, issuing CAs. Um, remember there's this tree of trust. A lot of companies make the mistake of they have one certificate authority for the entire company. The problem with that is if that certificate authority certificate becomes compromised, the only way of fixing that is to touch every device. So having a hierarchy is really, really important. So, we're just about at the end, so thank you for staying awake so far. Um, just want to summarize that, you know, X509 is, is, is a fundamental part of network security, whether it's internet, intranet, um, even offline uh, validation of files that you store on media and transmit. Um, don't ignore it. It can really be a huge benefit to your company when it's done properly. Um, it can add a lot of security, but if you don't do it right, if you don't pay attention to it, it can do the complete opposite. It can give um, malicious intruders the premise, the, the entry points, and the authority to represent your company in ways you cannot imagine. Okay, imagine someone who gets access to your code signing certificates and starts publishing software in your name. Okay? Not a good thing. Or email. Um, take control and be proactive. I think I've said that about four times. I'll say it one more time. Automation is really important. Again, don't leave it just to calendar. Okay? I'm not picking on you. <laughs> I, I did the same thing for, for, for many years. And that's, you know, that's what you do when you start. And it's a good way to start. I'm not bashing that. Um, and plan. So I will put up this one slide. If you guys have interest, um, we do have an, a three-day class that goes into this in a lot more detail. Um, it's so much more exciting than, than, than this. <laughs> I, I know you guys were overwhelmed. Um, if you're interested, you know, talk to me, I'll, I'll give you some more details. We do have a training class coming up uh, in February in San Jose. It's a lot warmer, there's no snow. Uh, so uh, that's, um, I appreciate that. So if you do have any questions, I'd love to hear them. <coughs> yeah. 
So you're reissuing these certificates every so often, as you said, no more than every year. Typically, though, do the, does the public and private keep their change at the same time? Or if you don't think you've had any intrusions, do you just keep the same pair and just sign a new certificate saying that pair is still good? That's a great question. Um, so if the, if the private key was generated using a hash algorithm that is still considered secure, then you don't change it. You use the same private key. Okay? That um, makes it a lot simpler to use, reuse the same key. You only want to change that key, um, say, if it uses uh, an algorithm that, you, that is considered to be um, compromised or near compromised. So let's say you, you were using, you had a private key that was RSA 2048. Today, that's considered good. <laughs> you wouldn't create a certificate, though, for three years or four or five because there's a good chance in the next, you know, two years, maybe three, that won't be considered secure anymore. So you only want to change the private key if you think the, the lifetime of the certificate is going to be safe. So there's an arms race going on all the time with regard to technology and public private key systems, as well as all of encryption. And what I hear you say is you ask yourself what the state of that warfare is, and you make a determination, yeah. and you determine based on that whether or not you're going to do the work of replacing the key pair. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, if, if you implement a uh, certificate management system, um, most of them um, will have policies, and you can centrally manage that so that, let's say, all your systems have generated RSA 2048 private keys. Um, you can say, okay, well, I'm, not, I'm worried about that. I'm going to set the renewal period or the expiration for three months or six months. Um, so, so when it's automated like that, the systems will automatically take care of that for you. And you don't, you don't need to worry about it. You set a long expiration typically uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you're lazy. Two, it's really hard to change the certificate. Okay? Because let's say you have one or two servers, you don't want to deal with VeriSign ever again. Um, and and I, I've, I've had this experience myself. Some of these CAs are very difficult to deal with. So you, you, you request a two or three year certificate. If you're doing it internally, you can set a six month or a 12 month validity. And then that arms race is less of an issue because you can automatically say, okay, just invalidate all of my certificates, push them all out um, automatically. And it's, that's very easy to do in these systems. Other, other questions? There's another one over here. So the software that you have to control them will actually go out to Apache and update the certificate in Apache once it renews? Um, our CertiCord software does that, yes. Yeah. yeah. On the agent side, um, it understands certain types of certificates are tied to certain applications and will uh, 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 notify or reload Apache appropriately when the certificate changes. Yeah. <laughs> That's something unique to our, our software. Most of the, um, there are a couple other players in this space that they don't Yes. So I guess I'm interested here. It seems like it's a lot of work to manage certificates and things like that, and it's also really necessary to do that. I'm just wanting from a practical day-to-day -day kind of thing. If this is, um, you know, in an environment with a lot of servers and a lot of things going on, um, you're talking about using a management software and, and that type of thing. Is is this you know typical for companies to to do that? Or do you have like a, a lot of uh, different tools that people are using? Is it uh, typical to have you know training and, and things like that, issues with people turning over and not understanding the new tool that the other team used, that type of thing? Yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a range. Um, most companies, uh, when they understand AI, just make it part of their daily practice. Um, they integrate it just like anything else, like, like it's DNS or NFS or something like that. It's, it's something that just has to be part of the DNA of, of the company. Um, and if you do that, it, it's not a real burden. I mean, the, the initial setup and the thought process that goes into it um, requires some effort, okay? There's, there's no getting around that. But you're, well, so like a follow-up then to that. So 
three years out, five years out, do you see the tool set for this getting much better? I mean, this sounds like it's a little further along than what I've seen. Usually the manual process, you have a calendar entry, you keep a spreadsheet or something like that. You have an automated tool now. Yeah. Are these tools going to get more and more sophisticated? Absolutely. Is it going to yeah. be something making it easier and more widespread? And yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, Certicord, our, our premise is to make the whole process very simple. You can um, uh, you can install the actual Certicord server in, in a matter of a few hours or a couple of days, and then you know there's there's two commands on the command line you run to uh, you know essentially register the the Linux box as part of the certificate environment, and it's managed. And the sophistication around application integration is one area where, where uh, I see a lot of potential growth. Uh, right now we have support for specific applications like Apache, um, but um, it's very easy and one of our next steps is to make it a pluggable um, interface where you, the customer, can say, just tell me if there's a certificate renewal and then I'll go off and fix my own internal application and tell it, here's a new certificate. Okay. So, um, there, there's, there's been some very, uh, there, there's two very large players in this space, uh, Venify and Centrify, um, and they have a, a, a great reputation in terms of capabilities, but their systems are, are on the high end in terms of both complexity and price. And so Certicord is something we've, we've targeted at um, uh, easy to use, quick to install, and, and a lot cheaper as well. Sorry, that was kind of a commercial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, other questions? The system you guys had this uh, Certicord. Certicord, uh, yeah. It's a, you have a uh, server that acts as the management console. Yes. And then you have agents that run on all your servers, all your nodes. Yep. Right? Um, that server, that, that management console, is that Windows or Linux? Well, what you get is a uh, it's a web interface. The actual okay. server itself. Um, uh, oh, you sell us a, a, a hardware solution? No, no, okay. no. It's it's software solution. It's built to run inside a virtual machine. Okay. Okay. Um, there's several components to it. Yeah. Um, uh, today, it runs only on a uh, Windows server, but um, it's actually designed to run on Linux, and uh, we're just adding support for the, uh, mobile sign certificates, and you can certainly install the server on Linux as well, without any Microsoft dependencies at all. It's just the first version we have um, only supports the Microsoft uh, certificate authority, uh, so that's why we only support it. But you, as the as the management, you get a web console you can access from any device, Linux or Windows, um, and that's your so interface. In, in my network, I have zero Windows. Uh, I will keep it that way. Yep, that's not a problem. Forever. Not a problem. You're yeah. lucky you can be that cavalier. Uh, you said a uh, server and a client. Uh, how does the, uh, how do you avoid uh, transmitting the private key from the server to the client? Great question. So. Um, the agent receives, uh, it does all the, the key generation <coughs> on, on the end node device itself. Okay? It gets a policy from our server that says, oh, for this certificate you need an RSA 2048 key. That comes from the server. The agent says, okay, I'll generate my own private key to that specification, I'll keep it here. And then when it needs a certificate, it creates a CSR, signs the CSR locally, and sends a CSR off to our server. So the private key never leaves the end node device. It's not sent over the internet. Other questions? Did you guys learn something new? Yeah. You all stayed awake, that's good. No. <laughs> you simplified a lot of the mystery. I mean, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. It's it's not it's not rocket scientists mm -hmm. science, and I'm not a rocket scientist. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess I'm trying to again get the practical understanding of how this works. So in your example there, you were running something and it was creating the key locally. You had to have access rights to the 
um, location that the key was placed, right? So in any case, I'm sure there's you know situations where more than one person would have root access to an environment. You're going to have to lock down the key in some kind of uh, folder somewhere, right? I mean, this is not going to resolve that type of security issue. Yeah, correct. If you have multiple uh, root users, they're still going to be able to read things. That's this doesn't solve that. Um, the if we do deal with things like um, SE Linux. Um, a lot of the uh, things like Apache um, use SE Linux file protections these days. So we do understand that level of file system access. But if you're a root user, you can you can you know change SE Linux settings yeah, to your heart's content. Yeah. yeah. There's no yeah. true ACLs. Yeah. Now, on the yeah. Windows side, you know we. Uh, we do support ACLs, but that's not for this meeting. <laughs> Were you guys offended that I, I, I mentioned Microsoft and no. Windows? No, not at all. No, 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 many of us have to deal with it. We have, yeah, yeah, we we have to live there. there. We coexist. It's a fact of life, right? Yeah. We tolerate <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have to. You know, the fundamental thing is PKI on the Windows side has been baked into Windows mm -hmm. since um, the early days. 15, 20 years worth. Um, and in fact, the, the agents in Windows support distribution of certificates automatically today. So in a Microsoft environment, you can push out uh, certificates and CA trust information from Active Directory to every Windows device in the entire enterprise. Um, it's, it's, it is free, um, but you have to know what you're doing to, to make it work right and you can you know with the right product um, make it, it it makes a very reasonable CA for for the Linux side if you don't have to deal with it directly. So your your product is managing your own local CA? No. No. Our product integrates we use the Microsoft CA and and we're about to launch support for the global sign CAs. Okay. Okay so we don't do our own CA. We're not in the CA business. We're in the business. Well, what I'm saying is, uh, 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 um, for my internal use, I, I am a certificate authority for my network. Yeah. You don't provide that level of. Uh, what What do you use to create certificates? Open SSL. Yeah. So, so we would we would come in and say, you know, you if you use Microsoft or Global Sign, you know, we could help you. But if you're using Open SSL, you're creating your right, you're you're acting as your own CA, your own CA software, and we don't we, we don't. Can you act as your own CA using Microsoft CA? That's, I mean, you're paying somebody to do that, right? No, no. Built into Windows Server is something called Active Directory Certificate okay. Server, That's ACS. How far out of the Windows world I am. Yeah. And it is a CA product that is built into Windows. You create CAs for uh, you create certificates for your enterprise, okay. and you distribute the the root uh, CA within your enterprise. Okay. And that's okay. So then you're you're deploying PKI throughout your organization with your own more or less private. Uh, it's a private uh, CA. PKI. Okay. Yes. So then you also uh, handle the, the, the public facing certificates. Right. So so we're launching support for Global Sign, okay. <laughs> and they have products that are both. Public certificates. They have one service for that. That's you know Google-like certificates, and then they also have an enterprise certificate service, okay. where they're essentially hosting the CA for you, but it's private to your organization. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll also be supporting other CA products. That's just the first one. Any other questions? All right. Yes. Is that that built-in Microsoft CA in Windows Server? Is that similar in uh, are there like pros and cons for that compared to OpenSSL? Um, it's kind of apples and oranges in the sense that you know, OpenSSL is essentially just a command line. It's a tool. Where the other is a management infrastructure. Right. And my, the Microsoft PKI is a, a, a database based product with a lot of GUI interfaces. It's deeply integrated on the Windows side. And then they have APIs and interfaces 
that we use to interface with it. So you would choose something like the Microsoft one um, if you wanted to get out of the business of dealing with certificates at a file level and the command line level. Okay? As you generate more and more certificates, if you want to do automation, okay, you can do that with OpenSSL, but you're, you're essentially building a lot of different custom scripts um, that, you know, you've got to maintain. So something like Microsoft PKI or GlobalSign, VeriSign, those are systems that manage the whole process and have policies. OpenSSL, you kind of you have the policy up here or in your script. Well, with the uh, Microsoft P, P, what is it, PKI, yeah. are you still self-signing your certificates? He, the, they're not self-signed certificates. You are your own certificate authority. Okay, so you have a certificate authority hierarchy that is private to your company. It is not known outside of your company unless you distribute those certificates and the, uh, the CA certificate. So it's something that's internal to your company only. There are other products, like the Global Sign one, where you can go to them and say, you be my CA, I want my some certificates to be public and some to be private or internal only. So you would do that if you had like some public facing machines and a lot of internal only machines. Or you choose two different products. You do Microsoft only internally because you can do it for free. And then you pay someone like VeriSign for your external public certificates. Because you know they charge per certificate. Even even in mass quantities, it, it adds up. Okay, I will uh, happily take questions afterwards, later. I'm here for a while. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.